welcome to This Just In, the show bringing you the latest advancements in healthcare, strategy, innovation, and public policy. And now, for the fastest voice in healthcare, here's your host, Justin Barnes. Thank you for tuning in and welcome to This Just In. I'm your host, Justin Barnes. In these segments, I'll bring you the latest advancements in healthcare, strategy, innovation, and public policy. As always, we're broadcasting from the This Just In studios on the Business Radio X network, as well as the Healthcare Now radio network. Before we begin with our special guest today, I'm very excited to announce that we'll be broadcasting the This Just In radio show again live from the Hims annual conference show floor on Tuesday, March 10th from 1 p.m. Eastern to 5 p.m. Eastern. This will be our sixth year broadcasting live from the conference, and I could not be more excited. And many, show, many thanks to my radio show supporters, Hims. Lenovo Health, Intel, Business Radio X, and certainly Healthcare Now Radio. If you're planning on attending HIMSS, we'll be broadcasting from booth 2521, very centrally located near the main hall entrance. So please stop by if you're in Orlando and see the show. If you've not been able to make the conference this year, you'll be able to stream our radio show again live at thisjustinradio.com between 1 p.m. and 5 p.m. Eastern. Last year, we had over 30,000 listeners, and it was a ton of fun and a lot of learning. We'll have another great slate of CEO, CIO, leading care providers, industry thought leaders, riveting authors, and certainly policymakers joining the show. Here are just a few confirmed guests. John Halamka from Mayo and Paul Serrato, on author. Uh, Rasu Shresha from Atrium. Neil Gomes from Thomas Jefferson University and Penn Health. Anish Chopra, uh, USC, former USCTO and from Care Journey. Karen DeSalvo from Google. Dr. Don Rucker from the ONC, National Coordinator, Steve Posnack, Deputy National Coordinator, Elise Sweeney-Anthony, and Catherine Marchesini. So a great list of, uh, of speakers and uh, could not be more excited. And we have even many more thought leaders joining the show for the second hour. Uh, and we hope you can all join us in some capacity. But without thir- further ado, for this episode, my 193rd episode, we are very fort- fortunate to have back two healthcare pioneers and leading authors, Dr. John Halamka and Paul Serrato. Welcome back to the show, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. And so we, before we dive back into the, your new book, Reinventing Clinical Decision Support, and this is your fourth book together, um, but before we dive in, John, explain your new role as president of Mayo Clinic Platform. Obviously, a lot of industry discussion around this. People could not be more excited for you, but tell us about it. Well, sure. I guess the first question is, what's a platform? <laughs> And, and let me state it this way. Do you know, see, Justin, well, you're not quite old enough to remember, but in the day when we had rooms to rent, we would march down to our local newspaper and we would place a want ad and it would be a one-off ad hoc process and maybe a hundred people would see it. It was expensive and slow. Well, today there's this thing called Airbnb and millions of people with little effort and little cost can list rooms for rent and renters can look at them by millions. It's an extraordinarily efficient way to connect a producer of a good with a consumer of a good. Mm. And of course, that connector doesn't necessarily even own the good, right? It's just a, it's a platform that connects the two. So what Mayo said was, we have all these folks creating machine learning algorithms and novel tools and data analytics and mobile devices, but every time you try to introduce them into healthcare, it feels like you've never done it before. It's Mm. back to that little newspaper office in the want ad. (laughs) It can take 18 months of just going through legal and compliance to get the agreement signed. Yes. And so could you create a stack of technologies, APIs to get input data? Could you create a set of policies and template agreements a support staff of people to make it happen and standard processes to make these things happen with agility so that suddenly you can do collaboration and partnership in weeks, not months to years. And so I've been charged with launching three lines of digital business, one around data analytics, one around bringing acute care services to the home, and one about taking diagnostic data from wearables and home-based devices and bringing wisdom and action to it. Love it. So is that also, will you, I mean, we'd be publishing a blueprint in some ways for other people to do that as well. So we can, as an industry can learn from that and that collaboration. How are you doing? The interesting thing about Mayo Clinic and, you know, this, I've been in this industry for 40 years. Yes. I started in healthcare when I was 17. <laughs> honest. Exactly. Um, 
I've never seen an organization as so devoted to the patient. Mm. And so what Mayo believes is the patient always comes first and everything we do will be published, discussed, made available and shared outside the Mayo system. So the hope is this platform would be useful throughout the world mm. and not just in Rochester, Jacksonville and Scottsdale. That's fantastic. And, and this, and you kind of feed it here, but tell us about the vision to transition from some of its care from brick and mortar facilities to virtual care at home. Well, as Paul has mentioned in his comments, mm -hmm. we're getting to the point where the tech is no longer an issue, right? I mean, it's sort of a strange story, but at um, Unity Farm Sanctuary, there are 103 internet connected devices providing me telemetry on 250 animals and I can adjust lights and locks and temperature. <laughs> but yet we don't do that for patients. Right. You know, wait a minute. <laughs> so if the tech is good enough, we have a lot of fear, you know, fear of change, risk and a business model that could disrupt what I'll call fee for service heads and beds medicine. Yes. And so now is the time. And so Mayo is worth is willing to make the investment to test out new care models of bringing acute care to the home with advanced technology, even recognizing that the business model isn't quite perfect yet. About a couple of years from now, we hope it will be. Right. Love it. Congratulations. We're, I mean, we as an industry are so excited to, to see this and look forward to seeing what you implement and then obviously what we can learn and glean from that. So thank you, John. It's great. So why is Mayo one of the best places to realize this transition? So Mayo um, has a almost 150 year transition of being willing to experiment. It has a culture that's willing to constantly innovate and try things. It has the resources to make it happen, and it has a mm -hmm. reputation such that it seems like a great collaborator. And so many in industry uh, will come to help the effort. So I, I think it, it's a combination of technology, policy, and culture that makes it the one place that might be able to pull some of this stuff off. And the one place that could pull you to do it, because <laughs> you can probably pick where well, you, want, you want to do so. Yeah, but so Justin, you know, imagine you know, I'm going to give you the following job description. You know, must right. be an MD engineer with 30 years of digital transformation experience, international travel, speaking and writing ability, <laughs> and we're going to give you the resources to change healthcare in the world. Amen. Go. I love it. I know. When I when I first heard it, I just I I smiled from ear to ear. I said, this is this could not be a more perfect post for a more perfect person. So it's excellent. So. Um, diving over uh, into this book, um, and, I had, and I've had a chance to read it, and thank you very much, Paul, for sending it to me, Reinventing Clinical Decision Support. And I do like the uh, John Luke Picard. So before we dive into the book, where did that, <laughs> where, where did that come from, your, uh, your initial lead in there with John Luke Picard's quote? Oh, oh, well, John and I are both big fans of Star Trek. Uh, and some of the moral stories that you get, especially in Next Generation, are, are very inspiring. And there's a, actually an episode in which uh, one of the characters, uh, a young ensign, uh, decides that he's going to lie to the captain mm. about something that, that killed uh, a, one of his uh, classmates. So uh, Picard takes him aside and says, you know, basically what, what the, the, the uh, dedication says, you know, okay. if you're going to be uh, a member of Star Trek or, or Starfleet, you have to be serious about telling the truth, regardless if it's a personal truth, historic truth, yes. scientific truth, any truth. So what we did basically was take the word uh, out of uh, the quote that talked about a, uh, you know, Starfleet right. officer and added in writer because it, it applies. I mean, if we're serious about finding the truth and, yes. and relieving patients' misery, we have to tell the truth whether it's pleasant or not. And that's one of the reasons why our, yes, we're, we're enthusiastic, we're optimistic about AI and machine learning, but we're not naive. This is evidence-based optimism. Right. And because of that, we, we, see, we see the need to, to talk about the downside of, of these technologies. Yeah, I could, not, uh, I could not agree more. And so that's a great lead into my next question, really the first question focused on the book. You know, are AI and ML overhyped? 
Um, and what are some of the you know, criticisms, obstacles, and limitations of artificial intelligence and machine learning in healthcare? Yeah, it, it, is, it is very much overhyped. And there are some vendors now getting into the field who realize that they can make a quick buck by putting something out that, that has very little value in terms of improving patient care. Um, some of the research is, very, is retrospective as opposed to prospective. Uh, and the best studies really have to look forward rather than look back. Uh, we need more randomized control trials. Uh, uh, another issue, and I think John brought this up earlier, is some of the data sets are not all that robust. They may be small. They may only be uh, tested. Uh, the, the data sets may only be tested in, in limited environments, one hospital as opposed to two or three hospitals. Um, and then the other issues, biases. Uh, some of the data sets may not include patients who are African-American or who are gay or, or women. You know, there's a long list of, of uh, ways to uh, screw up <laughs> a data set. So mm -hmm. all of these issues have to be addressed and not, they're not always addressed. That's excellent. John, all right, let me give you another quick example of how it could be overrated. So Justin, do you realize when you woke up this morning, your white count was five, mm -hmm. but at tonight at two in the morning, your white count will be 13. Well, wait a minute. No one in medical school ever said that the white count varies by circadian rhythm. Well, ask yourself this question. How many people get their blood drawn at two in the morning? Oh, that would be sick people. Right. right. <laughs> so machine learning will make a conclusion, not understanding that the data underlying white counts in, ho in hospital labs is completely unevenly distributed. <laughs> Yeah. We have to be very careful about the questions we ask of the data. Yeah, and even at a, at a simple level, for a living like me, um, the white coat syndrome. My blood pressure would always go up when I went to the doctor's office, but it was not as high when I was at home. So it was just that's even the good, white coat. That's a good example. Coat. That's a good example. Yeah. Yeah. And for those just tuning in, we're speaking with authors Paul Serrato and Dr. John Halamka about their new book, Reinventing Clinical Decision Support. So... Gentlemen, discuss the black box problem in AI, how it affects clinicians' view of these tools and how it's being solved. Yeah, this is, to me, this is one of the most important issues. Uh, so the black box problem is basically clinicians don't understand how the technology works for machine learning because the, the data science is so complicated and, and the uh, mathematical equations are so bizarre that for the average doc or nurse, it's easy to say, well, this is probably not the real deal. Uh, so the way that you address that is, well, education for one. Um, I'll give you a good example of how great a need this is. Um, last year, John invited me to speak at Harvard Medical School. We sp I spoke to a, a small group, a select group of about 30 executives and physicians from around the world and I showed them a clip from a PBS show that explained how neural networks work. Really basic, as simple as possible. And afterwards, I had people coming up to me. Can you sh give me a link? Can you share your slides? And you think about this. These are some of the smartest people in healthcare in the world. Mm -hmm. And yet they found it valuable to learn more from a simple PBS program. Mm -hmm. So clearly, there's, there's a thirst. There's a need for this. And this is one of the ways that... that uh, the black box problem is going to be solved. I agree. You want to add to that, John? Uh, I think what clinicians are looking for is a result, right? Because the EHR has created such a burden. They're looking for any technique that is going to enable them to spend more time with patients and to go home at night thinking they have done what needed to be done. So in my discussion with clinicians, they say, boy, if you give me a black box and that black box is a community standard of care, that's okay with me. Yep. Yeah. And that actually came out in uh, my last, uh, the previous think tank that I had, think tank five, where I was actually, I, I didn't think that what you just said was true, John. But then when I had a, several care providers get up there that are starting to use artificial intelligence and machine learning in their care that they provide, they actually were comfortable with it. And I was thinking that they would not necessarily because you have a lot of the philosophy that we've heard through the years. If it's not done by me, it's not right. I do it and it's, it's right if I do it. But they were not doing it all. They're allowing the technology to augment their care and they still believed in it. And that was encouraging. Do you have any thoughts there? The, um, 
encouraging. Yeah, I, I'm beginning to see in, in my conversations with, with physicians and other experts that slowly but surely they're, they're coming around. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, not, not only are individual clinicians coming around, but uh, federal agencies are starting to see the importance of explainability. Um, I was just talking to, to one doc who put out that the CMS, the, the Medicare folks, mm -hmm. uh, recently uh, launched a uh, competition uh, asking vendors and other experts if they can come up with an AI solution to reduce hospital readmissions. Mm -hmm. And besides submitting the, their, their platform, they also had to provide explanations as to how these things work. So this is reaching the highest levels of federal government. They see the need for explainability. That's excellent. Excellent. So how are clinical decision support um, vendors looking to the future in reinventing themselves? Uh, I want to start with that is so that I know that um, traditional vendors of what we'll call rules and static articles are looking at ways that they can use emerging standards like the FIRE CDS hooks mm -hmm. uh, standard to offer more real-time customized advice in the context of workflow. And this is the really critical thing. Having the world's best AI that sits in an app outside of your workflow is unlikely to get used. It really has to be in front of you at the point of care, at the point of decision-making and action. So uh, Fire CDS Hooks is probably going to be the uh, new sliced bread. We'll see at Hims. <laughs> Love it. That's exciting. Any thoughts you want to add on there, Paul? Uh, yeah. I, one of the things we did for the book is we interviewed uh, several of the vendors who are doing, you know, really at the cutting edge of clinical decision support. And we don't have any financial interest in any of these groups, but uh, folks like uh, the people who put out up up to date and uh, clinical key and Dynamed Plus, uh, Visual DX, and some of the things that they're doing, as an example, up to date now has a pathways uh, approach. It's called up to date uh, advanced, and it's not a static uh, database. It's not just based on rules, but it's it's uses machine learning and AI to help individualize care, so the physician can plug in, you know, a set of specifics for each patient and go down a pathway to, to find out the uh, the best uh, route to take. So the vendors, the vendors are getting it mm -hmm. and, and they see the need, you know, either either you move in the right direction or you, or you die. And, and several of the, of the uh, vendors that we mentioned in the book are moving in the right direction. <laughs> That's great. Terrific. So, Paul, you devote a chapter to reengineering data analytics. And in one of your HIMSS lectures, you predict that big data will radically transform CDS. How is this going to happen? Okay, th th this is one of the things I'm really passionate about. Mm -hmm. the, um, the title of the book has, has, a, has a subtitle. So it's yes. Reinventing Clinical Decision Support, Data Analytics, AI, and diagnostic reasoning. And I put uh, data analytics at the top because of its, the promise that it holds. Um, it's hard to explain this without pictures, which is what I'm going to be doing in, in the lecture. But essentially what's going on is you look at the very foundation upon which uh, these systems are based. And they're mostly based on randomized controlled trials, uh, clinical uh, guidelines from uh, national uh, medical associations. Uh, and while those that knowledge base is valuable, we contend that it's also flawed. And the reason it's flawed is because when you take a large clinical trial and, and it comes to a conclusion that let's say uh, um, a particular diet and exercise program is of no value in patients with diabetes. It doesn't help reduce uh, cardiovascular disease, which is one of the studies we talk about in, in the presentation. So it came to that conclusion. Uh, so you plug that into a clinical decision support system and docs say, okay, well, I'm not going to bother offering <laughs> any advice about intensive lifestyle. So along comes another group of researchers about 10, 15 years later, and they, get, they look at the same 5,000 patients and they say, maybe there are some subgroups within these 5,000 patients that actually benefited. 
So they used a, 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 an MI uh, system called random forest analysis. And they looked at 84 different subgroups and did a, created a thousand different decision trees, something that, you know, it's almost impossible for humans to do, but for computers, it's pretty easy. And when they did that reanalysis, they found that 85% of the population actually benefited from the intensive lifestyle mm -hmm. program. But 15% of them not only didn't benefit, but they did worse. And when you combine the 85% with the 15%, they cancel one another out. So the original study was misleading because it didn't do a deep enough dive. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly, machine learning has a role in, um, in data analytics. And we go into like three or four different case studies that, that bring out the same point. Exactly. And this is one of the things Mayo is working on with inference. So I announced at JP Morgan this collaboration with a, a natural language processing machine learning firm that looks at the world's literature every day mm. and then combines that with clinical data. So to Paul's point, you know, I'm gonna let's just make up something sort of silly, Paul. You know, you talked about how we all lie about how much we drink. Um, <laughs> yeah. Not that you and I drink or anything, but. Uh, <laughs> But if you would look at the study, it says, oh, for a male of our age, two drinks a day is fine. And then there's a study that says, no, three drinks is better. And there's another one that says, oh, no drinks is best. Right. <laughs> and how do you take what are literally hundreds of conflicting studies and then ask, well, for the patient in front of you, how much should they drink? Because the answer is, it's pro all of the statements are probably true right. for the right subset. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, if you are a, both Paul and I are relatively thin yeah. and we're relatively healthy and we don't have a whole lot of medications, well, maybe two is the right number, but for others, it will be zero or three. Right. No, that's fascinating. And that's obviously, that's something from a, as a consumer, uh, that's an issue just for me or something that I think about because there's, there's, you know, is coffee good for you? It's great for you. It's not good for you. There's so many things out there. Alcohol, good for you, not good for you. One, wine, good for you, not good for you. And so I'd love to see some consolidation. And I, and I agree that I think this consolidation is going to come from where, you know, this book is going and where your wisdom is sharing. It's, it's around, well, hey, there's variables. And the answer is, you know, it's in this mixture of 185 points or 420 points that a machine can, can calculate and then spit out your specific what's good for you, your, your result. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's the future. That yeah. is the future. Yeah. Excellent. So real quickly, um, got about uh, two and a half minutes or so. You devote an entire chapter to systems biology, which is very interesting because I have not seen this before. What, what's the, you know, explain that field real quickly and why is that important to improving patient care? Okay, so most uh, healthcare um, research takes a what's called a reductionistic approach to uh, figuring out what causes disease. So it's essentially a, a divide and conquer, and you look at smaller and smaller and smaller units until eventually you come to the conclusion that there's one specific uh, cause to a disease. And that's really not what nature is about. Uh, so, for instance, uh, you look at AIDS and you come to the conclusion that HIV is the cause of the disease. Well, yeah, it's the main cause, but there are probably three or four or five or 10 other contributing causes. Mm -hmm. uh, so systems biology looks at the whole picture and the whole person so that they can find all these other contributing causes. It's a lot like what's going on in precision medicine. You know, you want to look at all the various contributing factors and then come up with interventions at the individual patient level to address all of those approaches. So obviously we can't, there's a lot that has to be said about um, the subject, but we can't squeeze it all <laughs> into two minutes, but that's essentially it. And as Paul gets to the, the systems biology looks at all the multiple interactions that might take place, because if you try to isolate a model and say, we're gonna look at just this one system, well, that's not good because you might optimize one system while minimizing another. You need to look at the whole patient. No, that's fantastic. Um, so, uh, gentlemen, we are basically at time. I, I truly appreciate you both. And, and for the sake of my audience and, and everybody listening, 
um, please check out their or check out their new book that's now um, officially launched, Reinventing Clinical Decision Support. You guys will be at HIMSS annual conference. Uh, you will be doing a book signing. Um, is that the entire time? When's your book signing? Do you have that on hand, Paul? Or John? Uh, that is a Wednesday uh, morning at, um, I think it's around 11 o'clock, if I remember, 10 or 11. But certainly. Yeah, um, I think it's, a, yeah, I think it's a, at, at 10 o'clock. That's my, my recollection. <laughs> 10, 10 o'clock, okay. Excellent. And um, certainly um, check out uh, John and Paul's numerous speaking engagements at HIMSS. And certainly, again, they'll be on the radio show uh, uh Tuesday, March 10th at 1.30 p.m. specifically, they'll be joining uh, the This Justin Radio Show, um, booth 2521, but also thisjustinradio.com. So, gentlemen, again, thank you very much for joining me today and taking time out of your very busy schedules. Uh, Always a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, John. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for listening. And please tune in weekdays at 2.30 p.m. Eastern, 11.30 a.m. Pacific. As always, you can track me on Twitter at HIT Advisor and use the hashtag ThisJustinRadio so we can respond to your comments from the show. If you miss any of this episode or want to hear more, all my shows are posted at Apple iTunes, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, Google Play, and tune in. Also check out the website that we launched at JustinBarnes.com. Thanks, everyone. Have a terrific week, and I hope to see you at HIMSS Annual Conference. 